Hey you more, welcome back to my channel, Aretha Brown here. Hello everyone. Today we will be debunking three of the biggest myths surrounding Aboriginal culture. <laughs> Last video I was talking about institutional racism and my experience in high school as an Indigenous student. And the crux of that video was to kind of demonstrate how if we don't teach Indigenous history, you know, assumptions have to be made about my culture. And today I wanted to take, I suppose, the three largest assumptions or myths and debunk them because um yeah why not this video was inspired by two things so number one a creative spirits article titled 24 myths you might believe about aboriginal australia which I, i'll link down below just because it's definitely worth a read within itself and secondly this was based on an instagram poll that i did uh, where i asked a lot of my followers particularly mob what are just like some of the most annoying myths that you encounter, you know, every day. And so, yeah, this is like an accumulation of all those things into three main points. I am Walkabout Man, wise Aborigine. Come with me on a journey through Aboriginal times, times, times. The first myth is that there's only one Aboriginal culture. And I think you guys would be kind of surprised as to how many people still believe this. I know this is something that I encounter all the time. Um, but yeah, it's the assumption that there's only one indigenous tribe, that we all speak the same language, we all have the same religious edicts, we're all from the one area, we all eat the same thing, and that just couldn't be further from the truth. Today there are recorded to be over 250 indigenous tribes and roughly over 400 unique indigenous languages here in Australia. However, this myth centers around the belief that all tribes, clans, and indigenous nations are the exact same. This is not true. We all speak our own unique languages. We all hold different cultural beliefs and stories. Uh, we all hold different knowledge systems that are determined by the different kinds of country we live in. We all look different and we all have different political stances and ambitions and we all want to help our mob in different ways. This myth is harmful because it assumes that all indigenous people are interchangeable, identical and in constant agreement. It's dangerous because it denies our complexity as unique sovereign peoples, but also because it co compares and pits mob against each other. Furthermore, I think we need to look at our geography. Um, as Australians, I think we often forget about how big Australia is sometimes. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those maps, I'll put it on the screen now, where they put Europe into the size of Australia and then you're like, oh my God, we're huge. Um, but if we go even further and we compare that map to the map of all the indigenous tribes here in Australia, we go, oh my God, like this is a lot bigger and this is a lot more complex than we ever kind of thought it was. You would never ever suggest that someone from Italy had the same culture or spoke the same language or even had the same political beliefs as someone from the UK or someone from Sweden and someone from Norway, you know? Um, it's really strange that we can understand cultural differences and borders and, and, and geographical boundaries um, and cultural boundaries when it comes to Europe, despite it being, you know, tiny, really. Um, but we can't do it with indigenous tribes here. Again, it's, it assumes that we're all the exact same when if you look at a map, it's like, how could that possibly be true? For example, myself as like a proud Gabangri woman from northern New South Wales, I have no more in common with some mob for example, over in Broome, you know, love my, you know, my Broome mob, obviously love you guys, but, you know, we, different sides of the country, you know, they're desert mob, um, I'm saltwater mob, we are just so unique and we are so different, um, but white fellas like to think that we're all the same group. And so, yeah, again, we can understand Europe's complexity, but we have a really hard time applying that same complexity to the different you know, groups here in Australia. And I think it's important for us to ask why that is. And in my mind, uh, if you deny indigenous cultures complexity, you are able to justify colonialism. We gotta stop celebrating a culture that couldn't even invent the bloody wheel for God's sake. We gotta start enjoying and living in Western culture. Meaning if you deny a culture's complexity, you assume a Darwinian triumphant kind of natural of order of things mindset in that black people are less evolved and we're trying to get to this more kind of western white standard it's the age-old argument of like oh 
all you guys had was sticks, so we brought you technology, so colonialism, <laughs> myth number two, the one true Aboriginal myth. Half of you is Aboriginal. Which which one percent of you is Aboriginal? Mate, you've got nothing in you that's Aboriginal. You are not Aboriginal. You you make me laugh. I mean, okay, you can People do like nice you, paintings and everything, and I respect that houses. work. Don't get me wrong, I respect mm. that work. But you claiming to be Aboriginal, you make me laugh. Yeah. You really, really do, because this is the problem with this of the country, power of and this is the problem with so many people in this area and this country. This is, is going viral. This shit is going let viral. Let it go viral, because people like you... I want you, to show racists like you to the world. People like you make a mockery of true Aboriginals. I have a lot of good Aboriginal friends. What's a true friends. Aboriginal? Um, this one is particularly annoying, but it's the assumption that all Indigenous people are really dark skin. We all live in a remote community and we're all, yeah, desert mob. And this is just not true. Since colonization, white fellas have kind of thought that they get to determine what constitutes an Indigenous person, which is kind of gross. Um, but more so, it's this kind of idea that any Indigenous person that in some way differentiates from this ideal is seen as less black or less indigenous, which is just not true at all. Aboriginal identity has everything to do with your connection to culture and it has, you know, not a lot to do with the colour of your skin. Um, if we refer back to the same map that I showed you guys before, it just shows you how big Australia is and it's like sometimes why people forget what the sun is, you know, <laughs> and the effect it can have on people and, and melanin, you know. Well, of course people are going to look different depending on which part of Australia they come from, because we're a vast country where, you know, your, your environment will, will inevitably change your physicality. Um, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 80% of Indigenous people actually live in major cities here in Australia or in regional parts of yeah, this country. So you're actually more likely to see mob at shopping at Coles or Big W than you are in the outback. Um, again, this notion of like out, you know, remoteness, I think is summed up perfectly by activist Uncle Gary Foley. We're the same tribe. Ah, look him up, he's really dead. Oh, I'll add like a little description about him below. Um, definitely read up about him because he's really cool, but um, he sums it up perfectly here. One of the things that's irritated me most, especially about earnest, well-intentioned, good-hearted young white people in Melbourne. For 40 years, too many of those people who realise that they want to do something for, to assist the Aborigine. The first thing they do is they go running off to the Northern Territory looking for some real Aborigine. And that in itself is a significant problem. And too few of those people ever have the insight to realise what they're doing by thinking like that. You know, what? Are there no Aboriginal people in Victoria? You know? Are there no communities in this part of the world where they live in their own backyard that don't have problems that are just the same sort of magnitude as any problems they're going to go and find in the Northern Territory? You know? And what is it, this idea of theirs that they have about real Aborigines? Where did they get that? Where did they get these ideas and why they think like that? There's no attempt to self-reflect before they go racing off buying a VW Combi and heading off in their quest for the, you know, the real black hole. So yeah, you don't need to travel to the Northern Territory or to the Outback, Outback to meet you know, a real Aboriginal person because what does that even mean? Um, if you're living in Australia, you're already living on top and within um, an indigenous community already and it's your job to kind of work out who that mob is and to kind of get involved and help out you don't need to travel anywhere and if you do it's kind of you know if you're traveling out back it's probably for your own ego why do white people always want to take photos of us rather than you know <laughs> wanting to help anyone because you don't need to go anywhere <laughs> Myth number three is that all Indigenous people have the exact same political goals and ambitions. Again, these, these myths are kind of all interconnected, but yeah, it's the assumption that we all believe and think and want the same thing for our community, but how could we possibly 
want that when we are all so complex and the issues are affecting all our communities are entirely different and need to kind of be tailored to fit each scenario, you know? That's why laws, you know, when politicians pass laws or talk about Indigenous people um, as like, you know, a larger group, it, it can get really frustrating. Take for example, someone like Jacinta Price, a Northern Territory Liberal candidate who is very much conservative and doesn't believe in things like the changing of the Australia Day date. Um, she's definitely deserving of her own video, which I will make because it is kind of problematic as fuck. But. I just like to see us grow up as a country a little bit and be more responsible in that regard, responsible for our own feelings. My point is, um, yeah, she very much sits in the kind of opposite end of the you know, political spectrum, you know, it's more right wing. And then you've also got people like, you know, former Labour Senator Nova Paris, who is very much, you know, left, left leaning. And this just goes to show that there's such an array of different political voices and opinions and beliefs and it's complex. To reference my favourite writer of all time, James Baldwin, who is just, ugh, he's just a gift to this planet. So he was like a, a civil rights activist and writer. He was also um, openly gay and he wrote about that. Like this is in the 60s in America as a black man. So he's just really deadly. I'll be doing some book reviews about him a little bit later, but to reference him. So in 1979, James Bowen wrote a collection of letters accounting the lives and assassinations of three of his close friends, including Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And in 2017, those letters were collated and published as the 2017 book, I'm Not Your Negro, which was eventually made into a film, which is really deadly, so go watch it. In one particular chapter, Baldwin talks about the political differences both him and Malcolm X had, despite both being civil rights activists and kind of essentially wanting the same end goal, writing, I was, in some way, in those years, without entirely realizing it, the great black hope of the great white father. I was not a racist, or so I thought. Malcolm was a racist, or so they thought. In fact, we were simply trapped in the same situation. And that is really telling of how I feel about Indigenous activism here in Australia. Mob are all collectively trapped in the same situation, trying to help it and navigate it in different ways. And each way is valid. Whether you take a more leftist leaning approach or even a more right wing or, you know, centralist view, each is just as valid. And honestly, in my mind, as an Indigenous activist, the biggest problem is the people that are indifferent, the people that don't care what happens either way. You should be involved in Indigenous politics and understand you know, the fundamentals of what's going on because, like I said, you're living in an Indigenous community. You don't have to travel anywhere, you're already in one. And so there's kind of no excuse not to be invested. My big thing to always remember is we don't need to convince people that are like neo-Nazis to believe in treaty or, or land rights. It's getting people that are indifferent to come on side. People that have probably never thought about indigenous politics before in their entire lives. People who probably have never even met an Aboriginal person and so don't really care how anything swings uh, politically. Those are the people that we need to convince. We don't need to waste our energy giving it to people that are never gonna turn and radically change them. It's people that kind of don't mind which way it goes. <laughs>